Heavy metal is famous for its powerful rhythm guitar riffs. Hi, I'm Troy Stetna, and today we're going to be looking at the main techniques metal bands use when creating rhythm guitar parts. From power chords to single note riffs, chromatic chord movement to the all-important palm mute, we got a lot to cover, so let's get started. The foundation of metal rhythm guitar is the power chord, and many timeless riffs have been constructed using nothing more. There are two common ways to play a power chord. The two-string shape and the three-string shape, which has the root doubled an octave higher. Generally speaking, you might tend towards the three-string shape when you want a big, sustained sound, while the two-string shape may work better for more active riffs, where you're sliding around or moving between chords quickly. In the end, though, it's really a matter of personal preference. Let's take a look at some typical power chord riffs. Here's one in the key of E minor. One, two, three, four. Metal riffs like this one often call for a dramatic pause in sound called a rest. Here's the same riff again, but now watch my pick hand and how I stop the strings from ringing during these rests. One, two, three, four. And here's another one, this time in A minor. Try for a connected wall of sound feel on this one. One, two, three, four. Now these power chord riffs can be made much more interesting with various techniques, and by far one of the most common is palm muting. To get the palm muted sound, just position your pick hand so that your palm presses against the strings near the bridge, like this. That's with the palm mute. The further you move in from the bridge, the more muted the sound becomes. You can apply the palm mute technique to just about any power chord riff to get things like this. One, two, three, four. Here it is again. Watch the pick hand. One, two, three, four. One of the most common palm muting approaches is the pedal tone riff. In these riffs, you repeat a palm muted bass note, which is usually an open string, and release the mute for a few power chords on top. For instance, you might play in E minor, you might mute the low E string in between power chords. You hear this kind of thing all the time. One, two, three, four. <laughs> I'll play it again. This time, check out the pick hand. One, two, three, four. We can also mix some sixteenth notes in to the pedal tone. This is very common. One, two, three, four. And again, for the pick hand, one, two, three, four. When you invert a two note power chord, which is a fifth, you get a fourth. For example, these chords, C5 and E5, could also be played like this. All we're doing is moving one of the notes either up or down an octave. In this E5, for instance, we can move the E up an octave like this. 
and that gives us this fourth dyad. Or we could move the B down an octave, and then we have this. So when you include these inverted power chords with the use of slides, hammer-ons, or pull-offs, you can get some great sounding riffs. Van Halen was a master at this type of thing. One, two, three, four. Here it is again. This time, watch the picking hand. Here's another one in A minor. One, two, three, four. Let me slow that one down for you. And you're not just limited to fourths and fifths either. Other dyads are used as well, like minor thirds, major thirds, minor sixths, major sixths, and tritones. You can get some pretty colorful rhythms by using these dyads. You might come up with something like this. One, two, three, four. Here's that one a little slower. Besides dyads, single notes are often used in metal rhythm parts. You can combine them with a power chord riff, like Ingve Malmsteen might do. One, two, three, four. All we're doing there is adding notes from the E minor scale. Here's that one slowed down a bit. Or you can create a riff of nothing but single notes. The minor pentatonic and the blues scale are common scales to use for these types of riffs. You'd hear bands like Tesla, Metallica, or Black Sabbath do this. Here's an E minor pentatonic example. One, two, three, four. <laughs> And one from the E blue scale. One, two, three, four. Finally, for some really wicked sounding riffs, non diatonic tones are often used. This means notes that are not part of the key. The flat second and flat fifth are really common choices in this realm, but any note can do. You can interject these tones as single notes or build power chords from them. You've heard Metallica use this device quite often. One, two, three, four. Or something like this. One, two, three, four. Well, that's going to do it for this lesson. Remember, the main elements of metal rhythm guitar, power chords, palm muting, pedal tone riffs, other dyads, single notes, and chromatic tones. If you keep all these in mind, you'll be writing riffs like a pro in no time. Good luck and have fun. From the first
first guttural strains of Black Sabbath to the new wave of British heavy metal to hair metal, and new metal, and every metal in between, the guitar has always been the driving force behind the genre's punishing sound. Hi, I'm Marcus Henderson, and in this lesson, I'm going to show you some of the greatest metal licks of all time from 10 of the metal scene's legendary practitioners. So crank up that gain, loosen up those fingers, and get ready to bang your head. <sighs> heavy metal was born out of the blues. And though guitarists like Eric Clapton and Jimmy Page had established the blues rock sound in the 60s, it was Black Sabbath Tony Iommi that first plunged those blues licks into the deepest pits of hell. Iommi based his licks on the minor pentatonic and blues scales. This Iommi style lick comes from the E minor pentatonic scale. Note the use of one and a half step overbends to place additional emphasis in the minor tonality. One, two. While Black Sabbath was crafting the soundtrack to hell, proto-glam metalers Kiss were busy designing the netherworld's wardrobe. Like Iommi, Kiss guitarist Ace Frehley based his metal licks primarily on the minor pentatonic scale, even invoking the great Chuck Berry in his solo on Rock and Roll All Night. Our next lick, based on the A minor pentatonic scale, is an ode to Spaceman Ace. One, two, three, four. <laughs> By the late 70s, a new wave of heavy metal was brewing over in the UK. That movement's first export, Judas Priest, with guitarists Glenn Tipton and K.K. Downing, pushed blues-based metal harder than ever before. Our next lick is based on the F-sharp blues scale and uses some bluesy quarter-step bends on the flat third for added dynamic. One, two, three, four. <laughs> Around that same time, another UK metal act, Iron Maiden, was crafting their own killer sound, setting the new standard for two guitar metal bands, a mark that to this day is still the most revered in the genre. This lick comes courtesy of the bluesier Adrian Smith, with syncopated full step bends providing the drama. This lick is called from the E minor pentatonic scale. One, two, three, four. <laughs> The other half of Iron Maiden's two acts attack, Dave Murray, also wields a mighty blues hand, but he shreds diatonically equally as well. This lick is set in E minor. Here's that lick played slowly. One, two, three, four. In the early 80s, an explosive young band called Metallica emerged from San Francisco, combining heavy metal with the breakneck pace of punk in a new music form called thrash. With riffmeister James Hetfield providing the backdrop, lead guitarist Kirk Hammett combined speed picking, legato techniques, scale sequencing, and whammy bar maneuvers to create a whole new lead guitar style in metal. The following lick is built on a descending sequence of eighth note triplets. One, two, three, four. <laughs> Here's that look played slowly. One, two, three, four. Later in the band's career, Kirk Hammett began to experiment with new sounds and techniques such as the wah pedal and exotic scales. One such scale was the E Spanish Phrygian mode, which is the fifth mode of A harmonic minor. It's just like a natural minor scale, except that instead of a flatted third degree, it contains a flatted second. This tapping lick makes fabulous use of that flat second to a major third rub. One, two, three, four. And here's that lick played slowly. One, two, three, four. Megadeth founder and guitarist Dave Mustaine was actually an original member of Metallica. Lucky for us metal fans, it didn't work out, and instead, we got two legendary thrash bands out of the deal. 
This next lick is inspired by Mustaine's use of a repeated pull-off motif in E minor. One, two, three, four. Mustaine's sense of rhythm is impeccable. Make sure not to rush the lick, as easy as it is to do. Here it is again played slow. One, two, three, four. Sporting black and white Gibson Flying Vs and Explorers, Scorpions guitarists Rudy Shanker and Matthias Jabs rock the minor scale like no one else. That being said, Jabs would occasionally insert chromatic passing tones into his lines. This is a great tool when you want to use a speedy passage to get from one target note to another without sounding like a scale exercise. Here's an example of that technique. One, two, three, four. Here's that lick played slowly. Be sure to use alternate picking for a steady rhythm. One, two, three, four. Schooled equally in the blues and classical music, Ozzy Osbourne guitarist Randy Rhodes rewrote the book on metal guitar phrasing and technique. One of his undervalued contributions was his use of sequences and motifs. Our next lick takes a four note sequence down the fretboard in half step increments for an out sounding lick that lands comfortably on the root, B. For authenticity, play it like Randy did and use a slight palm mute on this lick. One, two, three, four. <laughs> And here that is slowly. One, two, three, four. After Randy's tragic passing in 1982, Ozzy went through several capable guitarists, but none who seemed to fit that mold. Until Zach Wilde, that is. With monster chops to match his monster physique, Wilde has become arguably his generation's biggest guitar hero. Like Rhodes before him, Wilde is also fond of sequencing, particularly using the minor pentatonic scale. Here's one of Zach's favorite pentatonic licks. One, two, three, four. <laughs> Note that there are no pull-offs used here. It's all alternate picking. Start slowly and gradually work your way up to wild tempo. One, two, three, four. The 90s were a dark time for metal fans, as an anti-guitar hero sentiment sadly caught hold. But one band, Pantera, ripped through that dark curtain like a razor. Pantera guitarist Daryl Abbott, better known as Dimebag, took his cue largely from Eddie Van Halen, combining supersonic blues scale runs with legato techniques and even his very own scale pattern. But to best sum up Dimebag's playing, the man could flat out shred the blues scale. This lick is built on a six note E blues scale sequence. One, two, three, four. <laughs> Here's that lick played slowly. One, two, three, four. Well, there you go. 12 crushing licks from 10 legendary metal artists. Be sure to practice these licks in other keys and areas of the fretboard. And try to work them into your own solos. Before you know it, your neighbors will be banging their heads rather than banging on your door. Welcome, guitar fiends, to the Modern Metal Guitar Lesson, 
I'm your host, Marcus Henderson. Metal is still alive and well. Bands like Lamb of God, System of a Down, Slipknot, Trivium, Mastodon, and many others are picking up where the older metal bands have left off. In this lesson, we're going to study the techniques and elements behind modern metal, from riffs to lead lines and beyond. Why do metal guitars sound so brutally evil, you may ask? Well, one big reason is because the strings are tuned way down. One of the more common tunings is drop detuning, down one full step. I'm already in this tuning, so right now let's get you into this tuning as well. I'll play each string and you can match your string pitches to mine. Here's the sixth string, which you'll tune from E down to C. This is two whole steps down from standard tuning, since we're tuning to drop detuning, plus an additional whole step. The rest of the strings are down one whole step from standard tuning. Here's the fifth string, which is now G. Fourth string, which is also C. Third string, which is now F. Second string, which is now A. And the first string, which is now D. If your strings are buzzing against the frets, you may want to try heavier string gauges to accommodate the slack tuning. Perhaps the most obvious component of the metal guitar sound is distortion. You can achieve this with distortion pedals and most amplifiers. Many metal guitarists will also use an equalizer on their tone to scoop out the mid-range so the highs and lows are boosted and the mid-range is down. This gives a tight, thick sound with less of the mid-range blare. Riffs and rhythm guitar fill the majority of the metal guitarist's duties. Let's check out some of the techniques. In the first example, we'll take a look at palm muting, a technique you should get to know well. You should use the heel of your picking hand, palm, and let it rest on the strings just above the bridge, like this. The further away from the bridge you lay your palm, the more muted the sound becomes. Here's a basic palm muted riff. Lift your palm up slightly for the non muted chords. One, two, three, four. Let's play another one. This one is palm muted throughout. One, two, three, four. Another element of metal guitar is the use of alternate picking, or up and down picking. You alternate up and down strokes of the pick, thereby giving you more speed. Combine this with palm muting, and you've got pretty much all you need to start writing your own riffs. Here are several that focus on alternate picking. One, two, three, four. Here's one without palm muting. When you alternate pick, keep yourself relaxed and try to minimize your hand movement. Pick from the wrist, not the arm like this. Playing tight rhythm is crucial in a metal guitar band. Listen to bands like Lamb of God and Mastodon and you'll hear how cool it sounds when the guitars and drums lock in together for fast, complex rhythms. Let's check out some interesting rhythms to work on. One, two, three, four. Check 
that one out again slower. Watch my pick hand. One, two, three, four. Here's a fun one. One, two, three, four. Here it is again, slower. One, two, three, four. The latter half of the next riff should sound like a demon tiptoeing through your backyard. One, two, three, four. Why stop there? Here's another. One, two, three, four. There are a lot of different approaches you can take to playing lead in a metal song. Some bands prefer to include the traditional guitar solo, which is usually more expressive and technically challenging. Others use harmonized lead lines to create an instrumental theme or melody. And still others leave out the lead playing entirely, using higher pitched guitar lines to enhance the rhythm parts. Let's take a look at some of the components that make up lead playing. Modern metal bands often utilize octave shapes as a way to thicken up a melodic line or rhythm part. The basic octave shape looks like this, with the string in between muted by your fretting hand. This one is rooted on the fifth string. Notice how my index finger is touching the fourth string to keep it from ringing when I strum through the three strings. You only want to hear the two octave notes. When it's rooted on the fourth string, the shape changes slightly because of the B string. You'll probably want to get your pinky involved. The same thing occurs with an octave shape rooted on the third string. Since we're playing in drop D tuning, Here's how the shape would look rooted on the 6th string. The 6th and 4th strings are the same pitch, so the two notes are on the same fret. Let's try out a typical octave line. One, two, three, four. A lot of metal players will add effects to their lead lines to give them a different texture. Make them stand out for the rest of the band and inspire nightmares. Some common effects are wah-wah, chorus, delay, whammy pedals, and envelope filters. Here's a cool trick. Let's take a wah pedal and use it on the octave line we just played. Start with the pedal all the way back and very gradually push down as you play the example. Have your toe all the way down during the last measure. Sounds pretty cool, and you can use that trick on riffs as well. Let's talk about an idea that's similar to the octave line called tremolo picking. This is basically alternate picking as fast as you can. You can take single note lines and move them around on one string to create moving lines. You dictate the rhythm with your fret hand instead of your pick hand. The pick hand just keeps alternate picking very fast while you move notes around on one string, like this. One, two, three, four. C 
kind of like Lucifer's mandolin player. Another option you'll hear used often by modern metal bands is harmonized lead lines. Bands like Avenged Sevenfold and Atreyu will double up certain parts of the song, both rhythm and lead, with harmonized lines. Let's check out an example. Here's the melody line. And here's the harmony line. Well, that's all for this lesson, folks. We've covered a lot of ground. Thanks for joining me, and remember to practice. Welcome, my metalhead friends. I'm Marcus Henderson. We're going to explore the guitar style of the man who practically wrote the book on metal rhythm guitar, Metallica's very own James Hetfield. James composed some of the greatest riffs of all time, from Seek and Destroy to Master of Puppets to Enter Sandman and Beyond. We're going to check out some of the key elements of his style and learn some of the killer riffs in the process. So let's get started. The first thing you're going to need to get that Hetfield sound is some serious distortion. James favored amp distortion over pedals, and usually equalized his tone to achieve a thick bottom end, piercing high end, and very little mid-range. So that's highs, lows, and no mid. Got it? The basic component of all metal guitar is the power chord. Power chords are also called five chords and contain only roots and fifths. James favors the two note variety for easy access and speed. You can move this two note power chord shape anywhere on the fretboard on the bottom four strings. Here it is with the root on the sixth string. This is a B flat five chord. And here, rooted on the fifth string, this is E5. You can move these suckers all over the place. One, two, three, four. Ah, yes, the devil's tritone. Another huge part of metal rhythm guitar is the use of palm muting. This is a technique where you use the heel of your palm on the picking hand to mute or damp the strings just above the bridge like this. This will give you that classic metal chugging sound. The further you move your palm away from the bridge, the more muted and percussive it gets. James Hetfield does a lot of palm muting in his riffs. Another thing he often does is use all down strokes with his picking hand, even with the fast stuff. This gives a machine gun like attack to the sound, adding some much needed brutality to the proceedings. If it's super fast, then he'll use alternate picking or up and down strokes. We'll get to that later. First, let's play something, damn it. Here's the power chord riff from before, but now I'll add a nice palm muted chug on the low E string in between the chords. You'll have to lift your palm slightly off the strings every time you hit a chord and lay it back down for the palm muted E string. This takes some coordination to get the rhythmic feel right. Check it out. One, two, three, four. Okay, let's play that faster, like James would have back in the kill em all days. Watch my pick hand. You can gain more downstroking speed by allowing the picking motion to come from the wrist and not the arm. You can break up the repetition a bit by adding a riff change here. 
Hetfield often used many different riffs with contrasting rhythms and techniques in his compositions. I'll start with the first riff and we'll go right into the change. One, two, three, four. You can also get a nice chunky sound if you palm mute power chords by muting two strings at a time, like in this riff. We'll start on the AND of beat four. One, two, three, four. Or you can break up the palm muting a bit on this one to get something like this. One, two, three, four. Here's that again a little slower. Mr. Hetfield also used a lot of fast up and down stroke picking, or alternate picking, on the low strings in his riffs. Again, to maintain speed and accuracy, the picking motion should come from the wrist. Let's try it out on just the low E string with the obligatory palm mute. Notice how minimal the wrist movement is. I don't need much motion to make this happen. Check out this one. One, two, three, four. Mr. Hetfield would also break up this alternate picking style into more complex rhythms. Let's add some 16th note alternate picking to the power chord riff we played earlier. One, two, three, four. You can create a galloping effect by playing palm muted triplets like this. One, two, three, four. I'll play that one again slower. Watch my pick hand. I let the momentum of the last triplet downstroke carry the pick into the fifth string power chord. One, two, three, four. Of course, there are many great single note Metallica type riffs to explore as well. Let's take a look at a few, shall we? Here's a fun one. Use all down strokes and palm mute the low E strings. One, two, three, four. Here's one that sounds more like something from 90s Metallica, with a definite Black Sabbath influence. Notice there's a triplet or swing feel on the eighth notes. So play the first eighth of each eighth note group longer than the second eighth. One, two, three, four. James also uses a lot of cool techniques in his riffs, including slurs, slides, and pull-offs to open strings. Check out this one. One, two, three, four. There are many great Hetfield riffs that aren't distorted as well. Think of the classic Metallica tunes, and almost all of them have some sort of great arpeggio type clean riff. Fade to Black, Sanitarium, and One, just to name a few. An arpeggio is a chord played one note at a time. Let's switch to a clean tone and take a closer look. The first one uses some of the chord shapes that James uses frequently in his clean riffs. One, two, three, four. Here's another one. 
Notice how he often uses very simple shapes and patterns that make the riffs relatively easy to play, yet they still sound really cool. One, two, three, four. Here's one more arpeggio riff. One, two, three, four. All right, folks, that's it for this lesson. Enjoy the riffery and thanks for stopping by. Randy Rhodes was undeniably one of the most influential heavy metal guitarists ever. With his original, classically inspired sound, he revitalized the genre and paved the way for the shredding movement that followed. In this lesson, we're going to take a look at the key elements of the Rhodes style and learn what made him such a unique and memorable talent in the guitar world. Randy was a riffmeister, and his are some of the most memorable in all of metal. Let's take a look at some of his favorite tools for playing rhythm parts. A pedal tone is basically a repeated bass note under a series of changing chords. In the heavy metal style, this usually means palm muting a low note and interjecting some chord jabs above. Crazy Train and I Don't Know are excellent examples of this. Here's an example of this classic device in the key of A. One, two, three, four. <laughs> So in this example, the open A string is acting as our pedal tone, and we're playing two note power chords above it on strings four and three. And we're also adding our palm here to mute the low A string, which makes it more percussive. We release the palm mute for the power chords. A lot of times, Randy would arpeggiate chords as a form of contrast in the bridge of a song, maybe, or in a ballad. You can hear this approach in Goodbye to Romance and in the bridge to I Don't Know. He'd usually stick to chord tones, but he'd add some decorations every now and then with scalar runs, double stop figures, or passing tones. Here's an example of this style. One, two, three, four. <laughs> So we're just playing through the chord tones or adding little embellishments with other scale tones. Most of this progression has a D mixolydian sound, so that's the scale most of the embellishments come from. But the F chord at the end of the progression is borrowed from the parallel D minor. So on that chord, we draw from the D minor scale or more specifically, in this case, D minor pentatonic. Over the first F chord, we play this. And then, for the last F chord, we actually just run down the D minor pentatonic scale. Another thing Randy was a master of was adding fills into his rock riffs. There was rarely a dead space in a Randy Rhodes track. Let's look at some of his favorite types of fills. Since A minor was a favorite key of Randy's, we'll use our first riff in A minor as an example and demonstrate how various fills could be used over it. One of the simplest is a well-placed pinch harmonic. It's a good way to really grab someone's ear. Sounds like this. One, two, three, four. You want to choke up on the pick a bit and have your thumb brush the string at the same time the pick does. It'll take a bit of practice, but you'll eventually get it down. It sounds great on lots of different notes. Randy also made use of natural harmonics in his fills. The ones on the fifth and seventh fret were the most common. He'd usually add a dip with the whammy bar, 
or bend the neck a bit to make them stick out. One, two, three, four. <laughs> Another favorite fill of Randy's was cascading down the A minor chord form with pull-offs to the open strings. Sounds something like this. One, two, three, four. Use some left hand muting to make sure you're not allowing the open strings to ring out. When it came to solos, Randy was one of the greatest of all time. His leads were exciting, melodic, virtuosic, and very memorable. They usually contained both flash and melody and were constructed with a logical sense of direction and purpose. One of Randy's favorite solo devices was a fast, repetitive lick, usually from a minor pentatonic scale. You can hear these types of licks in Flying High Again, Mr. Crowley, and Crazy Train, to name a few. Here are some examples in D minor. I'll play them fast and then again slow. One, two, three, four. And here it is slow. This one's a little quicker, but the pull offs help with the speed. One, two, three, four. And here it is slowly. And this one sounds good with a little palm muting. One, two, three, four. And again, slow. Randy also used sequences quite a bit. Sometimes these were flashy pentatonic runs, as in Mr. Crowley. Something maybe like this. One, two, three, four. I'll slow that one down for you. And sometimes they were more melodic, diatonic phrases, as in this goodbye to romance like lick. One, two, three, four. He'd also throw in a diminished seventh arpeggio sequence into his lead sometimes. You can hear this in Steal Away the Night and in the live version of Suicide Solution during the cadenza. Something like this. One, two, three, four. And here's that one a little slower. One of Randy's trademark sounds was his mixture of the natural minor and blues scales. Listen to I Don't Know and Crazy Train for some classic examples of this. In the key of A minor, the scale would look like this in the familiar fifth position form. Here's a typical Rhodes lick with this form. One, two, three, four. And a little slower. Another classic Rhodes device is to take a short lick and move it chromatically up or down. He used this technique for some fills on Crazy Train and in the solos of I Don't Know and Suicide Solution, among others. Here's an example in A minor. One, two, three, four. And that one a little slower. Well, that's going to do it for this lesson. I hope you've gained a new respect for Randy's style. And be sure to check out the original recordings to hear how these techniques sound in a real musical context. Have fun.